Are you ready for some word tonight? All right, all right. Let's get busy. I want to talk about a couple of things tonight and tomorrow, totally two unrelated stories, but I want to deal with two stories while we're here that I think have gotten a little bit of a bad rap because of misunderstanding within their context. And context is everything. You've got to place a scripture to its audience, from its author, within the scriptures in front of it, within the scriptures behind it. What's the, what are they trying to say? What are they trying to do? And so I want to minister tonight on a story from, from Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel. That only those two actually talk about this moment in the life of Jesus and in his ministry. And as you know, that's the hallmark of our ministry. So we want to deal with Jesus and what he had to do and what he, what he did. But as I, before I read any scripture, I, I want to preface it all by saying this. Um, I do a lot of travel in churches. Um, it's probably 50% at this point of what we're doing. Uh, the other 50% is church groups in homes, uh, backyards, pool houses, clubhouses, HOA meeting halls, hotel banquet rooms, I don't know, wherever, wherever a bunch of people want to get together and hear about Jesus, we'll usually go. Uh, but in the church at large, there is still uh, a tragic thing happening. There's an insane amount of preaching to the old Adam. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Paul said that Jesus came as the last Adam to take care of the problems of the first Adam. There's not the first Adam and the second Adam. There's the first Adam and the last Adam. Because Jesus wasn't coming along so he could be Adam number two until Adam number three, namely you, came along. So God, God wanted to take care of all of it at Calvary. So the last Adam took care of it at Calvary. Uh, but we're still preaching to the first Adam as if the, the last Adam hasn't come, died, rose from the dead, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And what I mean by preaching to the first Adam is that we continue to preach behavior modification. We continue to talk to people about what they need to do to clean them up. And you can't clean up that which is dead. You can, but it's still dead. I mean, it's rotting. It's gone. So it's not about behavior modification. It's not about cleaning up. And how many of you know that if you're in a place where you continue to hear about clean up your act, clean up your attitude, you will shortcut actually cleaning it up and fake it till you make it. Any, anyone ever seen that? Let me tell you, I'm seeing that in a church all the time. The old fake it till you make it proposition, which is, I'm not there, but I'm not going to let them know that. I know the Christianese. I know the stuff to say. I know when I should throw my amen in. I know how much money to throw in that offering. I know when to go to that altar. I know to do all the things I need to do to make myself look the way I'm supposed to look. Now, as I study the Gospels, one thing I find about Jesus is that if there was anything Jesus had a problem with, it was hypocrisy. Hypocrisy drove him crazy. And if I went around the room and I asked, and not just typical to this building, but all over the world, you ask people, what is a hypocrite? They will say, that is someone that says one thing and does the other. But I would say to you, that's not a hypocrite, that's a liar. Now, you might counter and go, well, a hypocrite is a liar. But not in the classic sense of the way hypocrite was used in the New Testament. You see, in the New Testament, the word hypocrite's from the Greek word that has to do with actors and acting. It came from Greek theater. And what hypocrite meant was it was the guy on stage, and they were all guys, by the way. Guys even playing gal roles because women weren't good enough to be in theater. How about that? Aren't you glad Jesus died on the cross and gave equality to everyone Equality doesn't come from Congress, it came from Calvary. Only Christ has separated all those other walls. It took men a long time to figure it out. But In ancient Greek theater, you have men who come on stage and they play a role. And then about halfway through the show, they need another character. Well, they don't have enough characters. You only had so many actors. And so you would play the hypocrite. And the hypocrite was basically you took a mask of someone else and you held it up. Now, we would not handle that kind of theater well today. We would go, that's fake. I can tell he's holding up a mask. But it was, all, it was just for the effect of being a second character. You could even change again and be a third character. That was the role of the hypocrite. It was the person who was playing another role. When Jesus accuses people of being hypocrites, he's not talking about our definition, which is a guy that says one thing and does another. He's talking about a guy that puts on a front so he can convince people he's something he's not. Or, in other words, somebody that is putting something out there to affect what you think about them so that you may not realize who they really are. Or as I just now called it, fake it till you make it. 
I mean, I don't have this transformation thing down. I haven't actually turned into what they want me to turn into at that church. So I will act like I'm turning into that. I will play the game. I will go to the class. I will take the steps. I will do the journey. And Jesus confronts the Pharisees in Matthew 15. He runs into a bunch of guys. Him and his disciples are going to go eat. The disciples do not take a pit stop in the restroom and wash their hands. That was not unusual in that day and time. Um, the knowledge of germs was not out there as it is now, but there was a very, very, very heavy non-Torah rabbinical tradition. Non-Torah meaning it's not anywhere in the actual Old Testament, but it was a rabbinical tradition. The rabbis believed that you actually took in evil spirits if you didn't wash your hands before dinner. And so Jesus' disciples skip the soap and water, go straight to the table and start eating, and it drives the Pharisees batty. So they come to Jesus and say, how dare your disciples eat with unwashed hands? And Jesus and the Pharisees in both Mark 7 and in Matthew 15 have this verbal spat, this confrontation, which actually concludes with Jesus calling them hypocrites, which in the classic definition means you're one thing, but then you're putting on a mask so nobody knows what you really are. Because what is wrong in the Pharisee world, and I'll come back to the theology of that whole hand-washing bit in just a second, but what's wrong in the Pharisee world is that they have become extremely concerned with what other people perceive them as. That's very, very important if you want to come across as holy. Because if you want to come across as holy, that has nothing to do with being holy. But if you want to come across as holy, then you got to read the room. you got to figure out what the room considers holy. And then you got to do it, at least while you're in the room. And the Pharisees had nailed that. Because if you asked a Jew on the street, first century, first generation, what's the holiest man in Israel? They would have said to you, Pharisee. And if you had said why, they could have told you all the litany of outward things that a Pharisee did, the way he dressed, the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he acted. Jesus reads through the facade and says, I know you're hypocrites. And in one passage, Jesus says, you know what you guys are like? You're like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. On the inside are rotting corpses, but on the outside, someone took whitewash and cleaned it up. And you feel good about yourself because you look good, but I know you don't have anything real on the inside. That was the message of Jesus to the Pharisees, and he called that hypocrisy. Not saying one thing and doing another, but being one thing and acting like another. And so Jesus says, that's not going to fly. That's, that's not the way my disciples are. Now, the theology of the hand-washing thing, Jesus ends up telling them, look, these are traditions of men. He says, it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, it's what comes out of a man. And his disciples call him off to the side and go, please explain that. And I think Jesus kind of said, do I really have to? When you eat, what happens a couple hours later? Is this too ungodly for us? Okay, maybe not a couple hours later. That's a little quick, wasn't it? That's, <laughs> it's like, wow. What? Well, if you eat at certain places, yes. Insert restaurant here. It's your call. I don't know. Eat. 24 hours later, what happens? Let's go 24. Is that safe? We still good? Some people are going, 24, that would be a blessing. <laughs> Praise. Praise God. You get my point. Jesus says, it's not, it's not what he takes in. It's what's coming out. I, in case you haven't caught on. He goes, it's what's coming out of a man that actually defiles the man. He goes, what's, what goes in is nothing. He says, and then Jesus takes it spiritual and says, look, it's not what's coming in the ear gate, the eye gate that's messing people up. It's the fact that their hearts have lying and fornication and adultery. Jesus lists this laundry list of filth that everybody would categorize as filth. And he says, guess what made the man dirty? Not what he ate, but what he was. So he says, I'm not asking you to change what you are. I'm asking you to be honest about what you are. I'm just asking you to be real with what you are. So if you have fornication inside, I'm asking that. Let that be what comes out because only then can a man find true transformation when a man truly realizes who he is, what he is. That's the real message of Christianity. It's not bringing people in, diagnosing an error, signing you up for a class, and then taking your money every week to teach you how to treat the disease. That's the sin management business. It's transformation, which happens slowly. How does that start? See Jesus, and then keep seeing Jesus. And watch the transformation happen. But we ought to be in an environment of grace so great that people are free to be failures on their way to seeing transformation. And if your church is not free to see a bunch of failures on their way to transformation, then I would say that grace has not penetrated the fullness of the pulpit or the pew. Because if we still have to put the hypocrite mask on, on our way to getting where we want to go, then we haven't really arrived anywhere. 
And our message has a big hole in it. It has a big fault in it. Now, this stuff made Jesus sick. In fact, he gets so tired of it, at the end of that whole hand-washing bit, he looks at his disciples and he goes, leave them alone. I love that from Mark, uh, Mark, Matthew 15. He goes, let the Pharisees be. They're blind leaders of the blind. Blind leading the blind both fall into the ditch. Everybody knows that verse, right? Jesus said, just let them be because that's who they are. That's what they do. And then comes Matthew 15, 21. Let's start in that 21st verse. Jesus went out from there. I gave you all that story because this is the next thing that happens. Jesus goes out from there and departs to the region of Tyre and Sidon. I don't want to wear you out every verse with information, but I do want to set us up because this story is so crucial in the New Testament, and it's so crucial that you get all of that pretext we just did. Tyre and Sidon, far western shore of, of what we would consider Palestine. Tyre is a port city on the Mediterranean Sea. This could quite possibly be the farthest north, and it's definitely the farthest west that Jesus ever goes in his earthly ministry. What's el what else is important about Tyre? It's at the top end of what would have been the tribe of Asher, in the Old Testament, but it's at the far northwest corner, the far northwest quadrant of what would be considered Israel, but there's not a whole lot of Israelites living there. There's not a whole lot, Israelite would have been an anachronistic term, they weren't a nation, they're a people. There was not a whole lot of Jews living there, let's go religious. Not a whole lot of Jews living in the land of Tyre, Jesus goes there as an escape. In fact, when, Matt, when Mark 7 tells this story right here. It says, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon and went into a house and told them not to tell anyone he was there. What's that sound like? Vacation. <laughs> right? I mean, it, to me, Jesus, he doesn't go to feed people. He doesn't go to walk on water. He doesn't go to raise the dead. He doesn't go to cast out devils. He goes to get away. In fact, he goes to get away and says, don't tell anybody I'm here. I'm in this house. Now, you know someone there. He's not just a random stranger. Somebody lets him into their house. He stays. And as he's there, he doesn't want to be bothered. And it's not a hatred for people. Jesus isn't burned out. I honestly think Jesus is a little frustrated with the Pharisees. I really do, because of the story that's about to happen. I think this whole hypocrite thing has driven, and sometimes we don't think Jesus thought that way. He was, this per, he was above all these human emotions. He didn't get tired. He didn't, get, uh, he didn't go to the bathroom. You know, none of, the, none of the stuff that makes us human. But I got news for you. Yeah, he had all that stuff. And so I think after constant verbal sparring with the, the Pharisees, he goes, you know, boys, let's get away. we got a beach house in Tyre. It's right on the Mediterranean Sea. Beautiful spot. Let's go spend a couple of days. Let's hole up in the house, not even tell anybody that we're there. Let's just, let's just refresh, recharge. We'll go. We'll have a good time. We'll come back. And as Jesus gets in to the land of Tyre and Sidon, verse 22, Matthew 15. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. It's important at the top of the verse for you to realize who the woman is. The Bible says it's a woman of Canaan. Mark 7 says a woman born a Gentile, born a Greek, Syrophoenician by nature. And we got three pieces of information. She's from Canaan in the land of Syria, and she's Phoenician. Or let me try to help just a little bit. Canaan is the land Israel was supposed to possess. You never called a Jew a Canaanite. Because a Jew was the son of Abraham. They were called Jews. They might be from Asher. They might be from Naphtali. They might be from Judah. But they weren't from Canaan. So if you introduce someone as a Canaanite, you're introducing them as a Gentile. If you introduce someone from Syria, you're introducing a member of the Roman Empire. And if you introduce someone as Phoenician, you're introducing someone who probably doesn't even speak good Hebrew. So the woman's born in Canaan. In the nation of Syria, she speaks the Phoenician tongue. And if you missed it in all of that, she ain't a Jew. There's nothing about her that's Jewish except for a bizarre statement at the end of the verse. Or the middle of the verse. What does she say to Jesus? Have mercy on me who? Son of David. A decidedly Jewish introduction. Here is a woman who is, and I'm going to just repeat one more time, born in Canaan, under the Syrian flag, speaking Phoenician, who comes in in probably broken Hebrew, or at least Aramaic, the street language of the day, and speaks to Jesus and says, hey, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is possessed. My daughter's grievously vexed. 
Jesus had just walked away from hypocrisy from the Pharisees. A bunch of guys that said they were one thing, put a mask up, but then Jesus knew that inside were dead men's bones. He ran from that to a beach house so he could have a couple days off. And what's the first person that knocks on the door? A Canaanite, Syrian, Phoenician tongue woman doesn't know anything about Judaism that calls him, hey, son of David. And Jesus probably goes, oh, come on. No matter where I go, I mean, here's a Gentile now who has approached me completely out of her element. She is not anything, she is not presenting herself to me in any way as she really is. So we're saying, 2017 Christians, a couple, couple millennia from the cross, the resurrection, we know the book of Acts, we know how this whole thing goes down, and so we're looking back going, I, he, he swallows it and he just, he just takes her in, surely. He, he just says, oh, she can be whatever she wants, I'm here for her. Verse 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. Interesting non-response by Jesus. He doesn't answer her anything. He doesn't cut her down. He doesn't mock her. He doesn't cut her off. He lets her go through her whole spiel. But he never says a word to the woman. He answers her not a word. His disciples take it to mean, ooh, get her out of it. Because I kind of always think the disciples were just a bit (laughs) mafia-minded. You know, they were just always waiting for a chance to elbow someone in the nose. I mean, even if it's a little kid. Remember, Jesus is teaching one day and little kids are coming up and they're throwing, they're, they're like taking kids and chucking them. And Jesus says, don't, no, hey, let, let's, because he uses, he goes, suffer the kids to come to me. Let them come to me. Uh, so they were always trying to get people off of him. And I think right here they get excited because Jesus doesn't say anything. They think, they take that silence to mean, hey, kick her out, get rid of her. It's very un- important to understand why this is happening. Look at Jesus' next response, or actually his first response, 24. But he answered, now he talks, finally, and here's what he says. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We have a Canaanite woman born under the Syrian flag, speaks Phoenician. She does not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She has no rights to David. She doesn't know the throne. She has no rights to the promises of Israel, and yet she approaches Jesus, a man who she's heard of from afar, is staying at a vacation house on the beach somewhere in her town. She has a daughter at home that's grievously vexed to the devil, demon-possessed. She does the logical thing. I'm going to go find this Jesus. And when she gets there, she decides that the best way to approach him would be to approach him as if she were a Jew, because here's what they've heard about Jews. Jews have the hand of God. And and God moves through this man on his people. And Jesus ignores her request and responds with, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Let me show you how powerful and important this point is for Jesus in regards to how he deals with people. Look at Matthew 10. This is as Jesus is sending his disciples out to witness. Verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter a city of the Samaritans, six. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hey, disciples, I'm anointing you with power. I want you to go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, touch lives. I don't want you to go to one Gentile house. I don't even want you to go to one Samaritan village. I don't want you going anywhere that is not absolutely the majority of people, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I have come to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I have not come for any other cause. And if you stare at this in, in only within the lens of Jesus just came for the lost sheep. By the way, the lost sheep of the house of Israel tells you everything you need to know. These are God's sheep, but they've scattered. And Jesus came to bring them back. Because there's a pending event in Israel. And God has a, ju- a judgment coming against a system. And God does everything in his power to bring as many sheep into the fold as he can. They've been going in and out. He wants them to come in through Jesus. And you can come in through Jesus. Jesus, the culmination of all the promises made to Abraham, are fulfilled in one man, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus comes preaching that from day one. Kingdom is at hand. Kingdom is at hand. All you got to do is reach out and grab it. I'm what daddy looks like. I'm the fulfillment of all the promises. I am the land. I am the promise. I am the seed. I am the everything you've ever been waiting for. It's all wrapped up in me. Now, Israel doesn't take that on the whole, and it breaks his heart. Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, why is 
you know, I wanted to gather you in as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not let me. They reject him, but his ministry's focused at that. If you just look at that, you don't know anything else. It's easy to walk away from scriptures like this and go, God's a racist. Because all he really cared to do was come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he rejects a Canaanite, Syrian, Phoenician woman who comes to him with a legitimate need. And he won't have anything to do with her because all he cares about is Israel. But if you did that, you'd be ignoring the heartbeat of God through the Old Testament and all the way up into the New Testament, where God was always moving on the Canaanite nations that surrounded Israel. But God's first and foremost plan was to separate the children of Israel to the point, to the extent that they looked different than everyone else, that they sounded different than everyone else. This explains a lot of bizarre Levitical laws. How many of you have ever read the book of Leviticus and wonder why God is so mad about a man cutting the corners of his beard? No one? Go read it. And you'll go, why does God care if you have a goatee? Because that's what that means. Don't cut the corners of your beard. Now, you don't hear anybody get up on Sunday morning and say that. And you shouldn't because it's old covenant. And why why did God want them to not have shaved the corners of their beards? Because that's what the Egyptians did if they grew facial hair. The Jews grew facial hair because a lot of the, 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 the kingdoms of the world grew none. But when the Egyptians did, they pointed it off and shaved it into squares and long, and long tails. And God said, you're not going to look like Egyptians. You're going to look like my people. I'm not, it's not that I got anything wrong with Egyptians. But for this period of time, you're going to be separate and distinct because I'm creating a womb by which my Messiah will come out. Jesus came out of the vacuum called Israel. And so God's building this, 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 this fence not to keep people out. He's building this fence to... Show his people as unique, as sanctified, as different. Christ would come and take that fence and expand it to the world. As John the Baptist would say, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the what? World. World. Not behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of Israel, but the sin of the world. That Jesus has come to be the Lamb to take that fence and break it and send it over the whole wide world. And so Christ comes first for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but not only because he sent, I love that phrase, I go rather to the sheep of the house of Israel. In the Matthew 15 version, he says, I'm sent to the sheep of Israel, which means that he, he's called to go, but he never rejects people coming to him. Crucial part of the ministry of Jesus. When he goes, he goes to Israel because he's a man on a mission. But when people come to him, he will receive them. I know your confusion is, well, he didn't. This woman tried. We'll get back to her in a moment. When Jesus stands up in Luke 4 and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, remember that? And he unfolds Isaiah 61. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, recovery sight to the blind, all those wonderful, beautiful things. And he rolls the scroll back up and he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And he hands it to them and everybody gets a little queasy because what he just said was, this is that. You know, I'm it. And they don't really buy it. And Jesus said, that's okay. Prophet's not without honor, saving his own country. He said, were there no widows in Israel during the days of Elijah that God would send Elijah to the widow of Zarephath in the region of Sidon? By the way, here's Tyre. Here's Jerusalem. Here's Tyre. Here's Sidon. The Bible even refers to them a lot of times as Tyre and Sidon. This this twin city port at the north side of Palestine. Jesus says, were there no widows in Israel that God would send Elijah to to the widow of Zarephath in Sion? In case you don't realize, the widow of Zarephath was a Gentile. And what Jesus was saying is, were there no widows in the land of Israel? Why would God send Elijah to a Gentile? He says, in case you miss that one, I'll give you another one. He says, were there no lepers in the land of Israel? Why would God send Elisha to Naaman the Syrian. Syria, by the way. Here's Jerusalem. Here's Tyre. Here's Sidon. This whole bit up here, that's Syria. So God's already been there. He sent Elijah. He sent Elisha. And now the new Elisha is going to go there to a beach house and spend a couple of days. And what Jesus lays out in Luke 4 is it's not been beyond God to go find a widow that's a Gentile and bless her, Elijah, It's not been beyond God to go find a leper that's a Canaanite, a Syrian, Naaman, and heal him. So why would it be be beyond God that if you're going to reject the prophet sent to you, for God to turn to a people that are not his own people and make them his people? Now all of that stewing and stirring in the mind and heart of Jesus, because he knows his call, 
when the woman says to him, O son of David, have mercy, my daughters at home grievously vexed with the devil. And Jesus says nothing except, woman, I have not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Let's go back to Matthew 15. Pick it up in 25. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And Lord is okay. Because it's a generic term. It could have been any Lord. It's really a term of recognition. She recognizes him as having authority. And she says, Lord, help me. It's in this moment that the woman catches that by coming to Jesus trying to be Jewish, she got nothing. Why did she get nothing? Because she wasn't Jewish. But even that answer sounds like, well, you only get it if you're Jewish. Wrong. It's, she doesn't get anything, not because she's not Jewish, but because she comes to him with the exact same hypocritical spirit that he just left in Jerusalem called Pharisees. She grabbed a mask, stuck it in front of her face, knocked on the door and said, my daughter's sick. And Jesus said, I'm tired of masks. I don't care if it's a Pharisee or a woman with a demon-possessed child. All I want is you to be you. I just want you to come to me as you are. I want you to be who you are when we meet. Because my grace, and, and if you don't think the new covenant picks up on this, grace thrives in the environment of truth. And grace is stifled in the environment of performance, fakery, hypocrisy. What does James say? God resists the proud but gives grace to the, everybody knows it, to the humble. What's the humble mean? It's a guy that knows who he is. He admits it. If he's Canaanite, Syrian, Phoenician, he doesn't come up and act Hebrew. He just goes to the Father and says, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, when I titled this in my mind today, I titled it Lost Sheep and Little Dogs because I felt like Jesus does this on purpose. He just spoke, I came for lost sheep. She changes her tune and says, okay, help me. And Jesus says, why would I take bread meant for my children he doesn't say my but that's the insinuation. why would i take bread meant for the father's children because you talk about israel you're talking about family so when you see children sons in the new testament you're talking about being brought into the family what's john 1 say for as many as believe on his name to them he has given the power to call themselves the sons of god he brought you into the family you're not in a religion you are but but you're you're based on relationship not performance right and so what, what, what has been offered to a woman who's not a sheep who just figured out she's not a sheep is another animal. I, I don't want to overdo it with this, but I, I, I don't think there's coincidence here. Okay? So Jesus says, why would I take children's bread cast to the little dogs? And it sounds like maybe one of the single rudest things that Jesus has ever said or ever would say in his ministry. Maybe short of woman, what does that have to do with me at the wedding of Cana, right? When mom goes, hey, son, they're out of wine. And he goes, woman? <laughs> How many of you woman works really good in your house? Just start trying it. Just see how that... And then if they don't like it, go, Jesus said it. Jesus, I'm just, I'm just trying to be like Jesus. I'm just trying to be Christ-like. <laughs> I, was, I was in Midland, and that guy said, just go try to be like Jesus. And so, stop being a little dog, by the way. <laughs> now, use dog. Don't use something else. That, keep your minds out of the gutter. You, I mean, unless that's all that comes out of your heart, go ahead and be you. It's between you and the Lord. Right? We're off the rails, aren't we? Really just kind of warming up for tomorrow. I'll pick it up. We'll improve. <laughs> where were we? we we've been down this road before haven't we yeah you guys bring out the worst in me i do well all over the world i'm articulate i flow from point a to b to c then i get to midland <laughs> jesus offers another animal he goes why would i take children's bread offered to little dogs it sounds rough it's not as bad as it sounds because jesus takes 
The Greek word here, the Greek word is actually little dog. Because the old King James says, well, I just take the bread and give it to dogs. You go, oh, that's rough. The new King James cleans it up. They use the Greek adjective little because it's a whole different kind of dog. It's not a yard dog. It's not the dog that runs in and out. It's a lap dog. It's actually the Greek, Greek word for lap dog. And the lap dog sits in the king's chair, the head of the table, on the master's lap, and the master pets him, right? You know, little lap dog. Anybody got one of those? I see people pointing. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus says, would I, why would I take the bread that's meant for the children and hand it to the lap dog? Jesus has identified a problem. And before we go any further, I want to identify it with him. And I want you to see it. Jesus is not trying to insult her. He's trying to put her in the place at the table that she is spiritually based upon what Jesus has come to do, which is feed the children bread, find the lost sheep. Jesus said, why would I give the bread and cast it to the dogs? What Jesus wants to make sure is that whatever he's about to give, he's about to give with reception because she's not Jewish. Jesus throws healings out all the time. He never has people qualifying. He's throwing these out at the, at the lost sheep of the house of Israel who are worthy by Abraham's promise. But here's a Syrian, Canaanite, Phoenician-speaking woman who's already got one strike against her for acting Jewish. And Jesus wants to make sure that he is talking to who he thinks he's talking. He wants to make sure, and, and I, I know this because we have previous moment in this gospel where Jesus tells us how to treat individuals. You remember this from Matthew 7? Judge not lest you be judged in like manner. For whatever measure you judge out, the same measure is repeated back to you. What's Jesus saying? Shakespeare grabbed it and wrote a play called Measure for Measure. You give a measure, you get a measure. Whatever you give out, you give back. If you give judgment, get ready, you get judgment back. If you give good things, you can get good things back. That's Matthew 7. And then Jesus starts telling the story of a guy, same context, who's trying to clean up his, his neighbor. And he sees a speck in his neighbor's eye. The whole time he's got a beam. And no doubt it was meant to be funny because nobody can get a beam in their eye. Jesus is saying this to an audience going, look how stupid this would be. If you're trying to clean somebody else up and the whole time you got a log hanging out of your eye while you're trying to pick a, a fleck off your neighbor, right? Okay. How does Jesus describe that kind of judgment? Look at Matthew 7, 5. Hypocrite! Exclamation point. This is the same way he talks to Pharisees, right? First, remove the plank from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Before you see the next verse, just notice that Jesus calls it hypocrisy for you to try to act like you don't have a plank. That's the hypocrisy. It's for you to go about, judgment's not a bad thing even in this context. He goes, hey, it's good to take specks out of people's eyes. I mean, they appreciate it. They don't appreciate it if you had to hold your plank up the whole time you're working on their eye. If there's this stuff, you're acting like something you're not. Which leads to this, six, very next verse. Do not give what is holy to the dogs. Don't cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet, turn, tear you in pieces. Now, what we've done with Matthew 7 and 6 is we've taken that to say, don't preach to people that aren't worthy of it, because sometimes you cast your pearls before the swine and pigs walk all over it. I want you to notice how Jesus starts the statement. Don't give what's holy to dogs. What's the context? Judgment. A judgment. I mean, Matthew 7, 1, don't judge lest you be judged. He goes, you got to... You got a plank in your eye, your neighbor's got a speck in their eye. They want the speck out. What they don't want is a hypocrite doing it. He says, so be very careful what you present, how you present, and who you are. He says, because, and this is, this is a crucial moment that's, that's coming up. What, what book are we in? Matthew. What book is our, our Syrophoenician woman? Matthew 15, just a few chapters later. Well, Jesus is setting us up to say, don't give what is holy to the dogs. He's not saying don't give what's holy to Gentiles, but he's saying that there has to be a, a, an admission of who we are before we can receive what is holy. In other words, there has to be an admission of who we are before we can receive God's grace because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. 
Now, God's not asking you to go act like you're a sinner in front of God all day long. Don't get an identity crisis. If you're a new creation, you're a new creation. Don't go sniffling in front of God going, oh, I'm a sinner such as I. Please forgive me today. You already are a child of God. But when we come to him, let's be real with who we are. We don't have to confess what we wish we would be so that we will become it. You are what the Bible says you are. Believe you are who he says you are. And receive grace upon grace. Because of his fullness, we've already received grace for grace. Let's go back to Matthew Matthew 15. She said, yes, Lord. Even the little lap dog eats the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And the translation kind of messes us up. Because it sounds like she's saying, yeah, even the dog gets to eat. But what she's saying in the Greek syntax is, the kids have so much, they wouldn't miss the crumbs if you'd feed them to the lap dog. Okay? The sheep get so much, what would it hurt for one little lap dog, she says. Just get a crumb. This is the first time she's admitted she's the little lap dog. Did you catch it? Yeah, you, got enough, you got enough food to feed all your kids. What would it hurt to feed one little lap dog? Now what do you think Jesus' response is going to be? Next verse. Jesus answered and said to her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. What unlocks the grace of God in our life? You... It's all God's ever been looking for out of people. As many as believe on him, he hath given them the authority. He gives them the authority in the Greek, the authority to call themselves sons of God. If by one man's offense death came upon many, we used to quote this every Sunday right here, right? Do close service. How much more they who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus. What's Paul saying there in Romans? Saying that one man died and everybody inherited it. How much better is it that one man succeeded and all we have to do is receive abundance of grace. Let me say it again. All we have to do is receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and we reign in life. We don't have to do, we don't have to act We don't have to perform, we have to receive. So Paul gets to Romans 10, and he says, how can they believe unless they hear someone preach to them? And how can someone preach to them unless he be sent to them? For as it is written, beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the gospel of glad tidings and peace. And then he says this, for faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of original Greek, Christos. The more I hear of Christ, the more my faith grows. Did you notice that when Paul in Romans 10 says Israel doesn't know him, but they've got to hear about him. He says the only way they're going to know him is to hear him. The only way they're going to hear him is for someone to preach. The only way someone's going to preach is if someone's sent. Why? Because faith can't come without hearing. They have to hear. If they hear, they can believe. And then Paul proclaims that they would literally be in. They would be able to call themselves sons of Abraham and sons of God. So what was he waiting on for the Syrophoenician woman? He does not say to her, woman, great are your works. Woman, great is your attitude. Great is your faith. You see, when you came to me as a Jew... You were trying to come to me as something you were not because you hoped that that would earn you something. You did not have the ability to do it, but you came to me with a mask on and you thought I would give this to you. But all I really wanted you to do was come to me the way you are. Just be you. And when you get here, just believe that I'm me. And if the the you meets the me and the you Believes on the me. Woman, go your way. You have whatever it is you want. 
See, I don't believe there's anything that the Father will deny to you through his grace as long as you meet him believing on who he is. But so many of us plug in who we are, who we wish we could be, what we promise God will be. We make God conditional promises, Lord, if you'll do this for me, here's what I promise that I will do for you. If you'll bless me, you'll touch my family, you'll bless my kids, you'll bless our finances, here's what I'll do. We even try to make them really holy promises because we know that we, we believe he won't be responsive to the unholy promises. He only wants really good theologically scriptural based promises. So we'll, we'll tell God that we'll do stuff and then we'll quote scripture to him. Father, if you bless me with this, I promise that I shall pay. And then we always get like early 17th century King's, Queen's English, King's English, you know, because that helps. And we say, Lord, if you give me this money, I promise thou that I shall pay one-tenth of it unto thee Sunday. For thus saith the Lord, if we rob God of the tithes and the offerings, we shall be cursed. We quote it back to him. Yeah, I'm being facetious. Yeah, I am, but I've done it. I can only do it. I can only say it to you because that's been me. And to say to God, hey, here's what I did. Here's what I promise you I'll do. You just set yourself up for crazy failure. Crazy failure. Because you're going to feel a double-edged sword of condemnation. You're not going to be able to do it. And then you're going to feel bad for lying to God. Anybody been there? Anybody have? Yeah, yeah. Let's stop the foolishness. This is insanity. Our production in front of God. Be who you are. Be real. Now listen to this. I'm trying to wind down. If grace can't allow you to be you, it's not grace. If what you're hearing cannot allow you to be you, it's not the grace of God. One of the most important things that the Holy Spirit has shown me is that we have to bring back the kind of radical grace that frees people to make mistakes. Because the, the, the version of grace that is in there a lot is, oh, grace is great, God will pick you up if you mess up. God will you know, extend grace to you, but, but you need to avoid this and that. And, do, and I'm, not, I'm not pro go out and do things. I'm pro the grace of God. But we need to be freed I know this sounds so bizarre to some. We need to be freed into being able to make an error on the road to transformation. Rather than feeling like we've got to get it all right. And that's what's causing us to pull the mask out of the closet. And swing that baby back up and go, I'll get there. I promise, I'll get there. By God's grace, I'll get there. But until I get there, here's, here's who I want to be. And let's just be real. Believe on him. Now here's the greatest news of all. Paul says in Ephesians, whether you, that, that some of you were circumcised, some of you were uncircumcised, he says, but Christ has torn down the middle wall of partition that separated those two camps. Circumcised was Jew, uncircumcised was Gentile. Paul says Christ has torn down the wall that separates those two and has made one new man. That's the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. He goes, Christ has made one new man. What's he mean by that? In, because of what Christ has done at the cross. He hadn't went to the cross yet when he's dealing with the Syrophoenician woman. Okay? But because Christ has went to the cross, he's torn down the separation between a Gentile and a Jew. God's, God, God doesn't see man through the lens of the boundaries of nationalism, the flag that waves over your house, the skin color that covers your bones, the tongue, the language that you speak when you pray. God doesn't make the distinctions we make. We do that to categorize people. God doesn't categorize people. Christ broke down the last category. So Christ came. Paul even said he broke down the difference between bond and slave. Uh, bond and free, man and woman, Jew and Gentile. Paul goes even further to say, no distinctions to God. For God now, there are, and this is where I want to close, there's no such thing as lost sheep and little dogs. There's just people being who they are. Just people being who they are. So don't put on a mask to be something you're not. Be who you are. That's the beauty of God's grace. Christ has died to extend heaven into all of our hell regardless of who we are, regardless of our background, regardless of how much we know about it. And all he asks is you, this is it, this is all he wants. Don't pull out your checkbook. 
Don't make a commitment to the church and sign up to be a member. Don't, uh, don't, don't think you've got to make promises. All he wants from you is your faith. Believe on him. Father, you have made me righteous. What I just presented to you was a Christocentric viewpoint of Christianity. Why it is sounds so odd is because our palate is tuned to a man-centric view of Christianity. Our palate is so tuned to a man-centric view that we think something's wrong with preaching that doesn't tell us what to do. Because our palate only knows, I got to go get me fixed. I'm here to tell you that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, all things become new. You want to see transformation? I don't believe you've ever met Jesus and didn't want to see transformation. It's going to come by beholding his face, not by sticking up masks, faking it till you make it, be who you are, accept the grace of God, believe it by faith, let transformation happen even if it's slow, even if it's painfully slow, and dare I say, even if it never manifests itself in the natural. Faith. Because what happens is it doesn't manifest fast enough. This is classic. Doesn't manifest fast enough, so we <laughs> aid it along. A little works, a little performance. God needs my help. And I've told you this 10,000 times, Medlin. If you want an Isaac, you better wait on the Holy Spirit. But if you want an Ishmael, you can sleep with Hagar anytime you're ready. And you'll get a work of the flesh in no time. And don't ever forget, you can get a work of the flesh by using flesh, but you'll never get a promise work of the spirit by using flesh. You're his children. Father, thank you for this group. Thank you for this room. Thank you for lost sheep and little dogs. While we're not really either of them, the reality is we're both of them. I mean, there's no distinction anymore with you. You love us so much that you gave your son to tear down those walls, all that junk that was separating us as people. But your heart towards hypocrisy, I don't think it's changed. You still want us to be who we are. Father, I don't want to put any masks up, no pretense. I am who I am. And you love me in spite of it. <laughs> and I know that your people sense and experience your love. Father, I ask you right now all over this building and for those that might be watching and listening, splash us off with the water of your word. Wash us. As we lay our head on our pillow tonight, we feel refreshed. It has been good to be in the house of the Lord, to hear from him, and to know that he loves me. And if that is you, everybody say amen. amen. All right, God bless you.